This study tonight emanates from an email I received from a man named Joe. Uh, that's just his um, a, a name I'm calling him. It's not his real name. Uh, he wrote a question to me and I took some time to answer it. So I thought it would be a good study um, to present tonight. So Joe's question was, how do I know I'm saved? Uh, that's a summary of it, but it's pretty much what it means. So the study will look at the email that I wrote to Joe recently that was in response to a question he asked. The purpose of presenting the email as a study is to help Christians appreciate that if they understand God's conditions for salvation and meet them, then they can have some degree of assurance of salvation. Now, in this study, I have elaborated on some points not made in my email to Joe. I have also added some graphics that illustrate the points made just to make it a little interesting. And at the end, I've added a summary not given to Joe that helps encapsulate the full gospel message that Christians need to appreciate. So this is the question from Joe. This is what he, he, he actually wrote to me. So he said, Sir, as you mentioned, we have to work out our salvation and that we have to live a life of peace and strive to walk through, through the narrow way. That's pretty good. He's understood a lot of good things there. Now, excuse me. Uh, the Bible says there is no sinless person, then how can a Christian have assurance for his salvation? So this was a very good question that a lot of Christians ponder. So this is my answer to him. I said, thanks for your question, Joe. Firstly, everyone born into this world is destined to commit one or more acts of sin. This is because we are born with our old Adamic nature or our old man who encourages each of us to sin through ignorance or rebellion about what constitutes sin towards God. Now, this is a scripture verse that says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him at our water baptism, that the body of sin might be destroyed in the watery grave, that henceforth, meaning or from this point onwards, we should not serve sin as sinning Christians. So that all comes from Romans 6 verse 6. Okay, the emphasis is there that we should not serve sin, straight out of the Bible. So sinfulness yes. is the opposite of holiness. One cannot be sinful and holy at the same time. It's like someone saying they are freezing cold and boiling hot at the same time. It is a contradiction of reality and it re represents hypocrisy. And you'll remember that Jesus said that unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. And one of the key issues with the Pharisees was hypocrisy. So I got the question of a man who's very cold, that represents me, and someone very hot represents you, but we couldn't be in the same room together feeling the same way. <laughs> God requires everyone on earth to understand what he demands of them, which is holiness. Okay, That's what he requires in all the people on earth. Now, if people don't want to do things his way, they will end up paying the price for their own sins with their own blood. See, this is the thing that a lot of people don't understand. If, if, we, if we have Jesus Christ pay the price for our sins, then we inherit eternal life. But if we reject Jesus Christ paying the price for our sins, then our own blood is going to pray, pay the price for our sins, but we don't get any freedom from that because our our blood can't pay our own the price for our own sins. It's sort of like um, you know, I'm just saying it's either Christ's blood or our own blood. Okay, now in other yes, thank you. 
Uh, in other words, Jesus Christ is willing to become our redeemer, meaning he was willing to pay the price for our sins that we cannot pay to set us free from the penalty for sins. So that it says that in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. But uh, and providing that Christians don't go back committing the same sinful acts again. This is what it all means. If Christ has redeemed us from, from sin and, and set us free from the penalty of it, well, that's on the condition that we don't go back committing the same sinful acts again. That's what it all means. Okay? So to keep sinning after Christ uh, as uh, after we've accepted Christ as our Saviour represents hypocrisy. And this is the graphic here where you got the man here, he's putting on a smiley face as if he's happy uh, all the time, but underneath he's a frowny. So we've got a smiley here and underneath we've got a frowny. And that's hypocrisy. You either, you want a person all the time, either frowny or uh, smiley, but you can't be the two, all right? Okay, so in this, um, God first arranges for the true gospel message to be preached where the sinner hears the news that he is a sinner. That's the first thing that you say in the gospel message to someone. And if you say, if you say to the person, have you ever lied? And the person says, yes, you say, well, you're a liar. You say, have you ever stole anything? And they say, oh, of course. And they say, well, you're a thief. And then you say, well, have you ever looked upon a woman in lust to lust after? And they say, yes. Well, then you say, well, you're an adulterer in your heart. That's what Jesus said. So then you say, well, you know, you're a sinner because you've just confessed that you are a liar and a thief and, a, and a, an adulterer. So, you know, this is the first part of the gospel message is to bring someone under conviction using the law that he is or she is a sinner. The second part is all sinners are destined to spend eternity in hell. Okay, that's where God God created hell for the devil and his angels, and the devil and his angels want to take all of us there with them. Now, all sinners need a saviour, and Jesus Christ is humanity's only saviour from such a fate. Nothing else can save anybody from hell. Now, if the sinner accepts Jesus Christ as their personal saviour, he must first admit to God that he is a sinner in need of Christ as saviour. So that means he's accepted what what he what we presented to him before. The second part is he needs to confess to God the areas in his life in which he has sinned. This is reflects the weaknesses in his um, life. He needs to ask God to help set him free from these sins. So these are just some of the sins that he might be guilty of. And the fourth one is except that God has now wiped the slate clean from any condemnation of those sins as stated below. So once he's asked God for forgiveness and he's said that he's repented, uh, the scripture says in Romans 8, uh, one, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk, walk not after the flesh, meaning in the lusts and sinful behaviour, but after the spirit. So this means that I, uh, this man here has got to stop, he's got to crucify the flesh so that he can then walk after the spirit. Okay. So the next part here, fifth part, is an example. And it says if the new... Christian was to be run over by a bus a few minutes after being saved, he would immediately be in heaven because his sins have been atoned by the blood of Jesus Christ through the confession of his mouth according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. So that's, that's here, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus as Saviour and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So this is what we're all leading to. We're going to convict the sinners that they are a sinner in need of a saviour, and then they have to start doing all of this with their mouth and their heart so that 
we fulfill Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. So, in other words, other men would equate to being in the same situation as the thief on the cross next to Christ, who ended up in paradise with Christ the same day he confessed Christ as Lord. Okay, now this point here, number three, is however almost all Christians from the point of initial salvation have to live on many years after receiving salvation. So they need to determine what God requires of them in their new life in Christ. So most people are not like this Christian who's run over by a bus not long after he gives his life to Jesus. 99.99% of Christians have to live on many years after receiving salvation. So they've got to work out how they're going to serve Jesus Christ as their Lord. Now, as mentioned previously, God requires all of his people to stop sinning. This is because sin and holiness do not equate. They're like hot and cold, they can't exist together. They're like oil and water, they can't exist together. They separate. So this is what it's all about. A Satan is the tempter of all people to try and encourage us to continue in sin. That's his main role. Um, as it is his aim to ensure God's people, those who confess Christ as Saviour, to remain spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, so to overcome Satan's destiny for God's people, each Christian needs to implement the following processes. So the first one is that they have to resist the devil's temptations and he will flee from you in the name of Jesus. So every time you say in the name of Jesus, that's the most powerful name in the spirit world, we have to resist the devil's temptations. And so here we have an illustration of King David as the sheep, uh, you know, who, who minded the sheep. And this is Goliath. So he's telling the devil to get, get out of his life. And that's what we've got to do too. So we don't commit sin. Okay, so part B here is if Satan manages to tempt Christians to commit a sin... God has provided the following way for his people to overcome these temptations and the sins that follow. So 1 John 1 9 says that if, and you've got to remember here, this is an if, okay? Now, we have to confess our sins for God to become faithful and just to forgive us our sins, okay? This is a, this is our part over here that we have to do for every sin that we commit as as Bible believing Christians, and then God is faithful to forgive us our sins, meaning to wipe the slate clean again and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that that emanated from the sin that we committed. So Christians must then examine themselves. And it, uh, we can read that out in a minute to determine why he or she has come to the temptation that provoked the sinning to occur against God and to potentially frustrate or fail of God's grace. Christians can frustrate God's grace and they can fail of God's grace. And this is what the devil is aiming to do with Christians all the time. Oh, so it says there, let a man examine himself, right? That's in the communion elements. This is why it's very important that we do do this at communion. So, uh, Asma, could you read Galatians 2.21 for me, please? Well, frustrating means, like, if this, if this um, link connection between you and me keeps breaking up so that there's almost, um, you know, no connection... That's how we can frustrate God between us and God. We don't want to. We don't want to frustrate the grace of God, because if yeah, we funny. do, we we can fail of the grace of God. So look at it says here in Hebrews twelve verse fifteen, 
looking diligently, lest any Christ, this is any Christian man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many Christians be defiled. This is the King James Bible here, and I use it in its pure form. And it's saying uh -huh. here that Christians can fail of the grace of God. That means that it's like your grace is like a bottle of water and then all of a sudden it's it's gone and there's no more. Now, if people, Christians fail of God's grace, that means if it was like water, they would die of thirst, okay? Can you understand yeah. what it's saying in that first half? Yes. It is. It's there to put a warning to everyone that God, we, we're not to abuse the grace of God because if we fail of it, it's like if we were if it was water in a bottle um, and we failed of it, we would then die of thirst. So if the bottle is emptied and there's no water remaining, then that means the judgment of God follows on that bottle. Okay, right, so right. this is this is what it means. Okay, so if great grace is there to prevent God's judgment, but if the grace right. is frustrated and abused, it is removed, and then judgment follows. Okay, so we must then ask God to help us overcome this weakness in us. So this this is our if Satan has managed to tempt. Christians to commit sin, we've looked at how we can deal with it, but now we say we must ask God to help us overcome this weakness of committing sins. So to then become an overcomer of Satan's temptation, Christ requires of us to be that, such an overcomer, okay? So all Christians must request God that we be tempted and tested again by the devil. Who wants to be tempted and tested by the devil? But this is to ensure that we don't succumb to the same sin again. So as we can prove that we have overcome Satan's temptations to God and that we're absolutely cured of being tempted of committing that particular sin. So in God's eyes, he can then see that we have become exactly like his son, Jesus Christ, at overcoming Satan's temptations. Okay, this is what it's all about, is us becoming tempted and tested again until we're perfect. Okay, now in Matthew 4 verse 3, it says about Jesus when he was tempted and tested by Satan in the wilderness after he'd been there 40 days and 40 nights in his weakness. It says here, and I'm giving some examples, it says, and when the tempter came unto him, this is Jesus the first time, he said to Jesus, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now that's the first time he tempted him. And then when the tempter came to him the second time, he said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. And we won't read any of these. And then and when the tempter came to him the third time, he said, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So these are the three temptations of Christ by the devil in the wilderness. Now, in all these temptations, Jesus responded to Satan by saying, It is written. And then he went on to say, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then, when the second, after the second temptation, Christ said, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God in this temptation. Now, the third time, after Jesus was tempted the third time, he then told Satan to get the hence. Get away from me, Satan, because for it is written. So this is what he used. He said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only thou shalt serve. So he is reminding the devil of his re obligations to what he's supposed to do 
in regards to God. And, of course, the devil is the father of rebellion, so he's not going to do that. But Jesus was reminding him of saying, it is written, it is written again, and get the hence Satan, for it is written. And that's how we need to fight the devil, okay? We need to yeah. fight sin by using these three words or three phrases, it is written, it is written again, and get the hence Satan. So the point Whenever. here is that God gives spiritual strength to his people to overcome Satan's temptations if they want to exercise that strength. And this is where the battle wages in each of us between the spirit and the flesh. And it says, for the flesh lusteth, that word lusteth means wages war, okay? So in other words, if men see a good-looking woman walking along the street, there is a little war that can go on in our bodies or in our minds as to how long we want to stare at her or how or not, you know. And sometimes the flesh uh, wins against the spirit. However, this is what it means. It means that there's a war going on between the flesh and against the spirit. And the spirit... Or, also wages war against the flesh. So it's a two two person war going on within us. One's our carnal nature and the other's our spiritual nature. Because it says, and these are contrary or opposite the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. So this is what it's all about, and this is what we've got to overcome as born again believers, born again people were, uh, you know, have overcome the flesh and they're now operating in the spirit realm. And, and you've got to remember that the devil likes stimulating the temptations on the lust of the flesh. And we've got to remember that the devil's been observing us, taking notes ever since the day we were born. And he knows how to press a button to make us lust after the flesh, whether it's food or whatever it might be, okay? Anything in excess can be uh, a lusting. Okay, so in uh, part E here, it says, as the sons of God, and as you know from last week's uh, lesson, you know, we are the sons of God through the new birth. So that's the new birth reference. God the Father expects his sons of God, meaning currently on the earth, to, and but it's always been that way, uh, to act in exactly the same way as Jesus Christ lived while he was on the earth, while he was living in the weakness of human flesh. So God sent Jesus Christ to the earth to live as we are and to be tempted as we are, but he overcame. And so God said, you know, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, if you remember those words. So God wants to look down on the earth and see us as sons of God too and him look down on us and say, this is my son or my daughter down here in whom I am well pleased. Exactly the same thing, okay? So it's, it's something that we really should strive to achieve, okay? So... Here's the warning then, Matthew 26, this is the words of Jesus. He said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, so we've got to look after our flesh. Well, well we're supposed to crucify the flesh. Okay, that's the flesh nature, the old Adamic nature. But we've got to, um, you know, look after the spirit. You know, this is really what we've got to do. So this is, this is the man's question again. So I said to him, where your question said, the Bible says there is no sinless person, then how can a Christian have assurance for salvation? My response is this. So it's taken me a little while to get to his question, but this leads into it. So the first part is the Bible plainly, plainly states that there is none born righteous on the earth because all have sinned. I'll just read it out here. It says, wherefore, as by one man, meaning Adam, 
sin entered into the world and death by sin followed, right? So that's what happened. And so death passed upon all men. We've all inherited death in our mortal bodies because all have sinned. So this is what I'm telling my man here is that he's saying um, the Bible says there's no sinless person. Well, th I'm confirming that. I'm saying, well, all have sinned. So we're in agreement yeah. with his statement, okay? And then I said, as it is also written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So that's in Re Romans 3.10. So the second point I wanted to make to him was that although the Apostle Paul said that he was the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15, the Apostle Paul only meant that as a former sinner, that he in this he, he had committed murder and many other similar atrocities as Saul of Tarsus against God's people prior to his new birth on the road to Damascus. So I'm trying to say that all have sinned, we're born into this world and all have sinned, but the Apostle Paul in his former unsaved self was a chief of sinners because of the murder or murders that he committed and the, the murder where he refers to is the stoning of Stephen, okay, in the book of Acts. Okay, so this, this is what I'm reading from for um, Paul. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So we've right. all sinned, but Paul says, don't worry about your sins. You know, I've sinned more than you because of what I did, um, but I'm no longer sinning. That's really what he's trying to say. Now, the third point I'm saying here is this is why we each need a saviour for our sins, okay? And the fourth point here is Christ has provided a way for each of us to cleanse ourselves from all unrighteousness by following the follow next process, okay? So the first one is we confess our sins to God and others whom we have offended as an act of humility towards all who were offended by each sinful act, okay? And in that... The B, we repay any losses caused to others by that sinful act. So, for instance, if if you stole a car, a motor vehicle, God would be expecting you to repay that with four equivalent motor vehicles. Okay? In other words, he wants you to realise that it's very unprofitable to steal if you still want to be in Christ. And so you could go out and steal another motor vehicle if you wanted to, but you've got to repay it with another four. But you've got to confess it. You've got to repent of it. Um, but, um, you know, you can't keep doing that because you'd be a hypocrite and then you'd be broke. So we've got, got to demonstrate that uh, sin doesn't pay, you know. This is what it is. Um, if asthma could read out Luke 19 verse 8, You'll see Nicodemus speaking here, and he says, if I've stolen anything from anyone, I will return fourfold, four times the amount. Okay, so the, the next point in the process is repenting. Now, this means to promise or turn away from ever repeating that sin again, okay? Now, in Luke 13, verses 3 and 5, Jesus says... Uh, um, he, he's talk, talking about the uh, tower that fell on the uh, these men at Siloam and he says, ye shall all likewise perish except ye repent. So repentance is a very key process in getting rid of sin. Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's really the, the key verses, key words in that verse. Now, the next point here is that we must then stop committing re or recommitting that particular sin. This means overcoming Satan's temptations to repeat that sin by aiming to become sinless. 
Sinless means you have no uh, sins on your account in heaven or to anybody else here on the earth. Okay. He that committeth sin, this is talking about the Christian here, he that committeth sin is a child of the devil. This is very important here. A lot of Christians don't realize that if they commit sin, that demonstrates to God and to the devil that they are the child of the devil. All right? This is what our behavior demonstrates in the spirit world. Because it says, For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, meaning in human flesh on the earth, that he might destroy the works of the devil, which he did through shedding of his blood. If people use the blood for what it was, you know, shed for and stop sinning. Okay, whosoever, meaning any Christian who is truly born again of God, doth not commit any acts of sin. It's plainly written in the scriptures. You're not allowed to commit any acts of sin. For this, meaning his seed, meaning the promise of salvation uh, obtained in the scriptures, remaineth in him. So this means that when the Christian is tempted to commit an act of sin, the seed of a salvation remains in him and he says, no, I don't want to forfeit my salvation. I'm not going to commit that act of sin and offend my father in heaven. So then it says, and he cannot sin because he's truly born again of God. It's, uh, it, it, it determines who is a child of the devil and who is a child of God. Okay, those two verses. Okay, now the next point here is if Christians continue to, continue to abuse God's patience, his grace, and his long suffering towards them, God will eventually bring his judgment upon those who hate him and those are representative as sinning Christians. If you are a Christian and you commit any act of sin, that immediately says two things to God. You either hate me if you've been repeating it and you haven't listened to me and you haven't read my words, or it means that you haven't overcome the devil's temptations. You're still in your lusts. Okay? So I put in this verse of Scripture here, If I'll read this out first, and it says, For the time is come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. This is meaning today's churches. And if it, meaning the judgment from God, begins at us first, meaning the truly born again Christians, we're going to be judged as well. What shall the end be of them, meaning the sinning Christians in the churches that obey not the gospel of God, right? So the gospel has to be obeyed. If you've got sinning Christians who are not obeying it, well, then they're in trouble. This is where the judgment's coming. And if the righteous, meaning the righteous Christian, is scarcely saved, that means you really haven't got any assurance of salvation. Even if you're a righteous Christian, it only says you're scarcely saved. It's like walking a tightrope. You could fall off at any time. And then it says, where shall the ungodly Christian and the unsaved sinner appear before God at the judgment? This is what we're, we're faced with and looking at. So there's three types of, uh, well, there's three types of people here, okay? So you've got the righteous Christian who's scarcely saved. You've then got the ungodly Christian. This is the one who's walking in the flesh. And then you've got the unsaved sinner all standing before the judgment beginning at the house of God. Yeah, well, this is the sort of scripture that a lot of the churches wouldn't want to uh, talk about too much um, because it isn't, it isn't nice to talk about the judgment of God, but unless you've got the judgment of God in your beliefs, uh, everything else is just uh, fairy floss. It doesn't really mean much. Okay, the, the next point here is that the above process... Hang on, I'll turn the sound on. The above process of eradicating sin from our life must be repeated until every sin in the Christian's life has been overcome. 
Now, let's say that you've got a garment that's been soiled in a number of places and you then put it through the wash and then you dry it and then you have a look at it and you find that you've got one of the stains out very well, but there's two or three others. You've just got to keep going through the process until the garment comes up as clean as it should be and you know that you can get it. This is exactly the same process with every sin. You've got to keep putting it back in the wash until you're no longer committing that particular sin again. So this was the process of putting a garment through the wash um, to eradicate sin. So this is the same process we use. We've got to repeat the confession, the repentance. We've got to bring forth the fruits of repentance in our lives so that we're no longer got, got it in us. So this means at the end of the process as to whether you have become sinless is determined by your heart, which is the answer to your question above. So the question, the question was, if I can go back up to the question here, the Bible says there is no sinless person, then how can a Christian have assurance for salvation? So this is the question, how can a but Christian have assurance for his salvation. Okay, so if we go down here, um, I said this is the, what's following is the question uh, above. Now, if Asma could look up 1 John 3, verse 21 to 22, please. It says, For if our heart condemn us, and I'm saying about unrepented sin that you still need to de deal with. God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things, meaning about our need to continue to repent, okay? Now, this is if, if we, we're still lingering. Lingering means that we haven't done all the things God requires us to do. God's going to place it on our heart and we're going to feel guilty about what we've done in the way of sin, Okay, that's what it means. So God's, go God's going to con continue to condemn us. Anyway, the opposite thing is that if we have confessed and repented of all our sins and we've gotten rid of and eradicated sin from our lives, it says if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God, meaning that we no longer need to repent. So there's the two, the two halves of everything, look, allowing our heart to either condemn us or not condemn us. So in this aspect of sin and of the necessity to become holy, Jesus promises every Christian who overcomes Satan's temptations, and these are the promises. So what we, we need to take on board these very precious promises of Jesus to him that overcometh, okay? This is what Jesus said in Revelation. So he's saying here, to him that overcometh, I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is the first promise. And then he says, to him that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. That's in the lake of fire for all sinners. That's the second death. Um, for um, him to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written. So as you remember in the Bible, different people were given new names like Abram was given Abraham and yeah. Jacob was given the name of Israel and to Saul of Tarsus was given Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul. So Jesus has got a new name written in a stone, and it's a white stone, and it's in heaven, and it's together where the hidden manna is in heaven, and he will give this to us if we become the overcomers, the, the overcomer of Satan and of sin. Okay? So that is the third one. I'll just get down to the end and then we can talk or read about them. Then Jesus said, To him that overcometh will I give power, 
meaning authority or rulership over the nations, like a king or a queen, something like that. So this is in Christ's millennial temple, or kingdom rather, Christ's millennial kingdom. So he wants us to rule and reign over the nations on his behalf. So that's another famous promise that uh, we're given. And he also says in his second last one, to him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and I will write upon him my new name. So Jesus Christ himself will write our new name. I would assume it's probably the one that's in the white stone, but it might be a second name. We don't really know, but it says upon him my new name. That means you're Christ's and it can never be erased, okay? And then he says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame Satan's temptations and am set down with my father in his throne. See, this is called ruling and reigning with Christ, okay? You remember that picture of the chair that I showed a couple of weeks ago? There's the chair yeah. sitting next to Jesus with our names on it. We've got to make sure that we get there and take possession of the chair. Okay? I mean, we don't yeah. want to we don't want to see that chair taken away with our name on it. Okay, well that's what Satan wants to do. He, he wants us to, you know, forfeit the chair, forfeit the white stone, not be a pillar in the temple of God. This thing, okay? So I'm, I'm asking this man a question and I said, who would want to allow just one sinful act to rob a Christian of such glory with Jesus that he has promised only to the overcomers in the above statements? Satan's plan is to rob every Christian of all the above wonderful promises. Okay? So it's a difference when you know what those promises are. And then you think, well, do I want to allow anything to happen to me to rob me of those promises? Okay. So to stop sinning, meaning to become as holy as God is holy. This is really what it means, is that if you're a sinner, you're unholy. If you've achieved a state of sinlessness, meaning you've stopped sinning, then you're as holy as God is holy. It is simple as that. Okay? Yeah. That's the simple understanding that I have of it. Now, becoming holy as God is holy is easier than becoming as perfect as God the Father is perfect. Yet Christ says that perfection is achievable in this life. Okay? So if it's easy to become holy by stopping sinning, it, it can be reasonably easy to become as perfect as God the Father is perfect. Now, if Christians can first believe it's possible to become sinless by choosing not to succumb to sinful temptations and succeed, it must therefore be possible for Christians to become as perfect as God the Father. Now, these are the scriptures that relate to all this. 1 Peter 1.16 1 Peter 1 says, because it's written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Then it says here, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord, meaning no salvation without holiness be, it, it being evident. What this is saying is that holiness means that unless you've stopped sinning, you will never see the Lord. No man will see the Lord. All these Christians who tolerate sin will never see the Lord. Okay, that's how it is. Then there's this other commandment of Jesus. He says, be therefore perfect as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5 verse 48. And then it says here with the Apostle Paul, he says, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. So perfection in the Christian life is a process. Um, we, don't, we don't go into all of that tonight, but I think this man is to say that he's got to stop sinning 
and it's 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 achievable. And let's just go back up to this question here. There it is. The Bible says that there is no sinless person. It says, how can a Christian have assurance of his salvation? Well, I'm saying, well, if you go through some of these points that I've mentioned here, you can be sinless. You can um, you can achieve sinlessness, and it's not that hard. Okay, and you can collect some promises along the way. Now, what I didn't say to this man, so that's where I finished. So I said, what I didn't emphasize to Joe, because he had accepted the concept of initial and final salvation presented on my website, he said that what I needed to say was, was the battle between the flesh and the spirit occurs after initial salvation commences. That is where striving to enter into God's kingdom occurs, as shown in the chart below. So as we all familiar with this, the child's born, he's unsaved, he hears a gospel message, he accepts Christ as his saviour, he gets baptised, and then the hard part begins. This is the striving to enter in, and this is where the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit lusteth against the flesh. Sometimes he sins, sometimes he confesses and he repents, says he's sorry, pays four times what he stole, then he realises it's not profitable to do that anymore, and he stops sinning. And ultimately when God knows his heart that he really is trying to get into the kingdom of heaven, God births him into the kingdom of heaven and he's a new creation, and he then goes on. So this is what all of this is about. Which I, which he's seen, but he, he, you know, I have left this note to him. It says a Christian cannot become truly born again if he or she is still committing acts of sin. Sinning is not allowable as a Christian. Only holy sons of God who have overcome their sinful lusts will be permitted to enter into God's kingdom. In this, holiness equates to sinlessness as it proves that such a Christian has overcome their sinful Adamic nature and that Satan's temptations to make them sin or tempt them to sin are no longer effective. Um, I think um, we might have seen that before, did we? Yes, we did. So once this, the Christian through striving has entered into God's kingdom, he or she must then commence obtaining the spiritual gifts needed for them to perform their role in the body of Christ, such as a nose ministry, an eye ministry, an ear ministry, a hand ministry or a foot ministry. And there are other ministries that pertain to the body of Christ. We're all familiar with that drawing. That's wonderful. And as a member of Christ's body, each Christian should mature together and in doing so, bring forth the required spiritual fruit into God's kingdom together with the other members of Christ's body. Okay. Oops. Oh, what happened there? All right. So that's my drawing that you're very familiar with, with the baby. There's no spiritual babies allowed in the kingdom of heaven. We've got to have either children, young men, fathers or uh, good soldiers of Jesus Christ, okay? So we don't want any babies that are still uh, on the breast or on the milk of the word, okay? So that's it. That's the end of the presentation tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, God bless you all. So does anybody have any questions? So Hebrews 1 and 2 right, says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, that means let's leave, it means that for born again Bible believing Christians, they are to leave behind them the principles, and this is the fundamental and the basic principles of the doctrines of Christ. That means that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin that he was in a manger uh, and he grew up and he was a carpenter and that, you know, all the things that, and that he 
He suffered and he died on the cross, shed his blood, you know, rose after the third day and ascended into heaven. They're the principles and the doctrines of Christ as he was as a, a human being, okay? So we have to leave all those behind. They're purely for preaching the gospel. They're not to be, you know, you're supposed to know them in your spirit um, like you know the back of your hand, okay? They, 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 they're essential, but then you can't grow from them, right? You cannot grow from the principles and the doctrines of Christ. You have to grow on to other things, and this is what it's saying that you do if you want to move or go on to perfection. So it says here, you're not to lay, again, the foundation of repentance from dead works. So you see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You're not allowed to be um, a sinner needing repentance. It's supposed to be put behind you. So I would say that in the first year of someone giving their lives to Christ, they're supposed to know all about you know, Christ and how he came as a child and died on the cross and ascended into heaven. And he spoke, that person's supposed to have, you know, repented from all their dead works and moved on. I mean, I'm only talking about it from myself. That's what happened to me 30 years ago. So we're supposed to not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. I mean, we've got to show acts of faith towards God all the time in every day of our life. So this is really what uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying that you've got to leave all these things behind to move on to perfection. Now, to help you do that, you're supposed to know the doctrine of baptisms. Okay, there is more than one baptism. There's, there's the baptism in water, but then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit and there's the bap baptism of fire, right, the fiery trials, and there's also the baptism of believers into the body of Christ. So that's four that I can think of off the top of my head. I've got a feeling that there's six. I'll have to try and find the other two. But I'm just saying that there is more than just water baptism here, okay? I've just mentioned yeah. four. And and one of them is this is the baptism into the body of Christ. Now, the, the baptizer of that ministry or this ministry here, the baptizer is the Holy Spirit. Mm. I think it's the Holy Spirit. It's either Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. I forget now. I did a study many years ago. But I'm just trying to say that this is the baptisms that we're supposed to understand, right? If, if Christians can't understand the doctrine of baptisms, plural, well, then they're not going to move on unto perfection, right? So then it says, and then there's the doctrine of the laying on of hands, right? You've got to know what this doctrine of the laying on of hands is. And then yes. it says, and the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, right? So this is the resurrect, the first and the second resurrections, right? Christians, generally speaking, don't know what the resurrections of the dead are and when they occur and who's in them, right? Mm. And then they're supposed to know the doctrine of eternal judgment, right? So... Eternal judgment means that when the books are opened in at the great white throne, this is at the um, second resurrection, um, what's going to happen? Right? Christ is going to be the judge. But then there's a judgment in heaven for works that are either gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay and stubble. So that's the judgment for the righteous who, who managed to get into the rapture and end up in heaven. So this is um, the the second verse is essential to helping everyone to go on to perfection, and it says, and this we will do if God permit. 